Hello, welcome to the weekly package. I'm going to just sync the first one since we became a special interest group and no, and no longer a working group. Um, very exciting news. So, uh, we're going to go through, go around the room. Uh, so, we've been working on the last week, we're blocked on what we're going to work on next. Uh, I am picking brain, I'll be your host for this meeting. Can I have a note taker, please? I can do it. Thanks, Jim. Cool. Uh, I will go first. So <clears throat> I've been working on uh, lots of stuff with JSRFS, uh, less so much package manager focus, but working on the async await um, uh, changes, so basically ditching fullbacks and call streams and uh, it into async await. Uh, that's done for the exporter, the importers in progress, and then that's all going to trickle up to MFS, which is kind of also done. Uh, it's probably going to be me for the rest of the week. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Nope, great. Uh, Andrew, you're next. Hello. Um, so uh, I had uh, some fun this week. I wrote my first bit of Rust uh, and contributed to the WAPM package manager client uh, to be able to uh, add, to install a particular version of a thing. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, the the original client as it was published was very bare uh, and is kind of, I opened a few issues asking for some features. Uh, they've been very responsive. And then we had a call with them uh, on Thursday uh, to discuss how to um, add IPFS support to WAPM uh, and the different levels of integration that could happen, which I then kind of turned into an issue uh, of like here's some of the different stages or the ways you could go about it, uh, which uh, I'm planning on kind of then delving in a little bit further on stage one um, to literally like lay out here's some of the commands that you would run either over a HTTP API or a um, if you're in the client like what API calls to make uh, to help them get tables hosted on uh, IPFS and then kind of 1.5 I guess is thinking about how the client can integrate possibly the WAPM converted IPFS light uh, which is a fairly unknown like I guess beta uh, feature Hello, Mabel. Um, and basically trying to help support them keep moving and get a, a fast feedback loop of stuff uh, so that nothing gets dropped uh, as it, they go through. Uh, also looked into the Dino package manager or lack of one. It has some really interesting features from a usability perspective, but it throws out loads of reproducibility problems out there kind of <laughs> as a trade-off um, that it feels like IPFS can, can help, uh, but it, doesn't feel like they want that help right now. So there's a different, I could see Michael's just turned his video on because he has opinions or insider knowledge that'll be interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I know Ryan really well and I've known him through creating this and stuff. And, and he, um, yeah, he, he has really strong opinions about package managers that basically boil down to all of the best practices that we've designed over the last 10 years, he doesn't like. And so I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't necessarily bet on um, him agreeing that these are like the problems that need to be fixed necessarily. Yeah. So that, that was kind of the similar conclusion that I came to. Uh, there's there's uh, potentially still ways that IPFS could kind of support it without being directly integrated, uh, providing kind of a proxy that caches and, Gives some form of reproducibility and guarantees of the uh, the URLs contents continuing to be returned as the same thing, um, 
that also led to some interesting conversations with Eric, but I think he's got a note to talk about that in a minute. Um, and the other thing that I have not done much further work on is the IPFS concepts mapping document, but that is basically where I'm drawing all of the WAPM related uh, kind of documentation that I'm putting together for them. It's just focused on their use case specifically, which is a database backed package manager um, to kind of almost try it out to see how much I'm missing. Uh, so I'll be carrying on working on that. And that's about it. Jessica? Yeah, anything off me, it would be helpful. Um, so, um, thank you for the info about, um, oh gosh, gosh, um, continuing to work on the concepts mapping stuff because eventually I would like to take a little bit of a, um, a stab at integrating that into some of the work that um, I would like to be doing um, eventually. Um, turning that into something that's a little, um, that's that's more sort of public consumable um, as, a, as a primer, as it were, because I know that we've got that linked to um, in a related issue. Um, stuff that I have been working on, um, done or almost done, um, pinned down some actual definite package manager related goals in my work plan. Molly, I think you and I are going to talk about that tomorrow, which is awesome. Um, and a couple of other things that are not directly package manager related, but will help inform maybe some of our research and testing methodologies going forward, which is encouraging. Um, on a related note, also um, took some of the notes on DPLA Fest um, and the workshop that we led there um, and, and sort of pin that down into something that might inform how we might want to lead um, a package manager working session or workshop session um, at IPFS campus. That ends up being something um, that happens. I know that Molly, you've got that as a suggested workshop on the agenda. Um, so looking forward to seeing how that shakes out. Um, and then the stuff I, I want to be working on um, in, in the next couple of days is um, starting to work on user segmentation um, for package manager users guide um, tied to Andrew, what you've put in the pain points in issue 17, um, just using that hierarchy is, is our sort of main set of user personas as it were, and trying to expand on that a little bit. Um, and then also declining the telemarketer spam call and um, working on some initial sort of journey map or mental model ideas for those segments as well. So that'll be, you know, not the sort of thing that I get wrapped up in a week, but um, hope to dig into that more definitely starting now. Eric, you're next in the doc. Um, so I hosted some of the documentation that we talked about last week, so that's an, an issue now to go live there, that holistic tree thing. Um, I still feel like there's so many different ways that could go like further on the end of it like it just got up to the point where we discuss what decentralized authorship would look like and then it just stops right there so I'd love to see somebody take that and run with it someday um, <clears throat> another conversation that I had with Andrew that he alluded to this week is um, trying to understand some more of the different perspectives that you can come up with when you look at package management when it's done at distro scale, like Linux distro style. Um, because we've spent a lot of time so far focusing on like, what is it like for NPM or for like Go modules or any of these other things which are very focused on getting the story figured out for package management in the scope of producing a particular project. So all of these concepts like lock files and stuff are all very like basically comes with the idea that you've got this one repo it probably was on GitHub and it's going to produce like one thing. And that's the package management that we're talking about. And, um, and distros just resembles something totally different. And like, are there interesting concepts that those people in user stories care about that single project package management just like doesn't have or vice versa. 
And the answer is like, yes, probably. <laughs> um, so one thing that we talked about in particular is like version selection algorithms may vary depending on your perspectives. Um, this is something that isn't common in language level package managers. Like they might have ways to express version constraints, but the solver algorithm itself is like pretty fixed. And um, by contrast, something we might like to do if we were thinking about like distro scale, like really big ecosystem management is what if we had a whole bunch of projects and one of the constraints we wanted to solve for was if all of these things have a particular library dependency, like all of these things depend on bash or something, we don't care about anyone's particular version constraints quite so much as we care about reducing the total number of distinct versions selected by the aggregate group. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of literature about this and it's just kind of a thought that's brewing. So like maybe something about that is worth further thought. I don't know. Uh, that's it. Just a, a quick note. In the papers that I've read about Whoa, a wild Ollie Zilla appears. Uh, the papers I've read about package management all, almost always have kind of a distinct angle, very rarely cross between, say, distro package managers and uh, application level package managers. So there's, there's potential interesting areas of kind of research of the crossover or lack of crossover. Um, as as Eric mentioned there, that I haven't seen, but I, I may do another trawl of the of the um, published papers to see if there's anything else interesting there. Yeah, if not, we might write some papers about that, and they would be novel, and it might be cool. Be cool. I think, um, or something in in chatting with Stephen, and we were kind of brainstorming all these different use cases, um, things like big big Linux builds, like downloading all of Ubuntu, um, just have like a different characteristic in terms of size. Um, and so the, the cost of say, downloading the same Linux build on 20 machines in a computer cluster or um, you know, other scenarios where getting this sort of build into an environment that is relatively internet or bandwidth constrained uh, starts to have like, pretty significant impact of the sort of deduplication and overhead and peer-to-peer -peer, um, bandwidth reduction that IPFS could, could bring. Yeah, um, in scientific high performance computing with Linux, it's typically that's a core, there's a, usually something in the cluster that you know has a copy of all the repos and things. Um, and so that that's actually a place you could search for a lot of prior art for um, this sort of thing because it's it it, it it kills you if, if you have 500 node cluster and you're not going to download the same packages 500 times off the internet. So I'm, I'm going to talk. Uh, I dropped another note of a similar thing in um, in our shared pad. There's a project from Uber called Kraken that's about distributing Docker images inside of a cluster. Um, I forget if we've mentioned that one before, but it's an interesting example of that we were just talking about. Like, it's not exactly that they're bandwidth constrained; it's just that they absolutely know they're doing the same dang thing repeatedly, <laughs> and so it makes a lot of sense to try to like turn this into a swan operation. They have some interesting docs on that too. Uh, cool. Jim, do you want to give your update about the package? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So, as in the um, the the um, in web browsers meeting, and we were talking about web package, and then we we're all talking about, hey, you know, this package managers is the focus, but it's like web package, like like what Google is doing in Chrome is they're taking websites and they're turning websites into packages. So it's sort of funny because it's like a crossover with uh, what we're doing here. So with the with the HTTP signed exchange things, 
we're essentially taking a bunch of what's a website, putting into essentially the exact same format that you would distribute software in. And uh, I think there's a lot of overlap there. So, but it's interesting is like this web package thing's only been out for a few months and there's no real concept. Like the, the, if there's a package manager in that, it's basically what's, what Google's doing with their, with AMP. So, um, I, I, I think it actually breaks down the exact same way and I don't think anybody's really thought about it yet, so. There's an interesting hook back in there to Dino as well, um, Jim, that if you just treat your uh, your packages as URLs, that if you can, um, if you can get them to work in a similar way and you're acting like a web browser, then perhaps you can be like, oh, you can fetch this from anywhere as long as it is correctly signed, uh, which gets pretty close to IPFS style things. Maybe, maybe Dino would go for uh, HTTP signed exchanges, which is part of Chrome. And um, it'd just be like, oh, and they happen to be on IPFS. I don't know. Dino exists in this weird place where they're automatically translating stuff in TypeScript. Um, and so it's just not going to mesh very well with like all of these newer style import and module techniques that need only a browser um, and only something like send exchanges because there, there's always this compile step in between. So it's, just, it's like, yeah. I, I don't want to spend too much time trying to do Dino. There's like not really anybody using it yet. And uh, yeah, there's, it's inherently problematic. So. <laughs> We can just nudge them in the right direction. I've been nudging Ryan in directions for over a decade and it doesn't work. <laughs> Ryan's gonna do what he wants to do. <laughs> Ryan spent two years writing um, a, a NPM for C++ because C++ 11 was gonna be bigger than JavaScript. So like, I, and you know, I didn't talk him out of that. So I doubt that I can talk him out of anything in this. Are you saying we need to incept him? <laughs> Talking of um, you know, well, the platforms people are using, there was some progress on the uh, Pakote uh, PR. Um, Zcat's got back and said, you know, how does the performance compare? So I ran some uh, basic performance analysis, like so, pulling a tar like having a table on your local node already, pulling it from one on the network, pulling it from uh, a remote, like a, an AWS hosted server that you've got a direct connection to, and then pulling it from the DHT. Uh, and put the numbers up there and it's basically it's about you know it should tend to be the same kind of speed as a git like a host of git repository like installing directly from github uh, but it's one of those things you know the things that we need ipfs to do uh, in order to support package managers is speed and identity you know and like speed is definitely the first thing that everyone asks for and it's, it's going to be the crux of this this pr I think that kind of goes back to kind of the work, kind of the cladistic tree and and the like, the different layers of package bandit and stuff. It's like, at what what do you need for layer one to be effective? Well, you need it to be fast because content store you're fetching content. And like, what do you need for layer two? All right, now you're trying to like mirror registries and um, have your index, and then you know layer three, yeah, decentralized publishing, um, some amount of identity flows into there. I think question mark to us is like having having a couple of flavors of each of these would be really interesting to like compete against each other of like how much is necessary in order to get something that could even possibly function and how much is ideal um, in order to make something that's like really, really, you know, fits everyone's mental model in the package manager world. And we can, you know, when, when we have like stages within each of the stages, we, we start getting to a really, um, like a more detailed picture where we can figure out like wh where's the optimal balance um, for for us to push on. I mean, it's got to be speed, right? Like speed will absolutely kill every conversation if we're like, oh yeah, it's cool, but it's like three times as slow as the existing transports that you have. 
but it works offline by default. Yeah, I feel obliged to actually push back on that ever so slightly. I have a bunch of use cases and reproducible builds where I don't actually give a shit how fast it is at all. I care that it's reliable and I care that it gives me an integrity guarantee without pushing further work up to higher levels of my stack. If it's fast, that's nice, but it's actually, I can wait for speed optimizations to come down the pipe later. I mean, it depends on where the speed bottlenecks are though, right? Like, I think that, you know, if, if they're bottlenecks that are like, a lot of them get solved with a bigger cache state, then you can imagine a lot of these cases where like these performance, like trade-offs kind of go away given enough time and enough cache state. Um, but if it's if it's not really affected by cache state, if it's, you know, just inherently like, you know, the way that we're actually encoding the files or, you know, like our encoder decoder is slow, like that's not going to go away, right? Like all the work that we've been doing to like make the encoder and decoder stuff faster, like that's, that's obviously going to have a benefit no matter what. Right. So like, so it's interesting because I can concretely imagine an application where, um, for example, the IPNS resolve speed, I just don't care because what I want instead is the snapshot of the index by a specific SID already. So like IPNS just don't care. And um, maybe then I care about the speed of the, um, the fuse mount, but instead I might have some use case where I can like, if I'm doing reproducible builds, like literally I'm going to build the same thing repeatedly, right? So I can just copy files out of the fuse mount onto a standard mount of whatever other performance characteristics my underlying disks have. And I can cache that by the SID, which I've already got because the system's nice. And so I don't care about the speed of that either. Like I can immunize myself to a lot of this stuff. Um, if at a super high level, I happen to have the, the cool selection algorithms figured out because I'm doing distro scale stuff. And I try to make sure that I'm using the minimum spanning selection of unnecessarily different versions of some package then that just increases my cache hit rate for all these other things that immunize me against not caring about the speed of the transport. So if I take all of those together, yeah, <laughs> I get rid of a lot of the speed constraints in such an application. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to make sure to note real quick. So in Q3, I kind of expect to at least get started, if not have some, some stuff to, some usable work on, um, larger graph mutation APIs. So if we're taking like a, a bulk change set to, to a large piece of data, um, or, or like, you know, if we want to take the last 10 seconds of NPM activity and, and update like, you know, the whole graph for all of NPM or whatever, um, it's just much more efficient to do those in batch operations. Um, and we're, we're going to write APIs to make that a lot better. The catch is that they're going to be built on top of the data model layer. So it's not going to work with DAG PB and it won't work with the old Unix FS. So we need to make sure that we're upgrading to the new Unix FS in order to get any of these like future performance benefits um, out of stuff like that. Good thing that's on both Go and JS OKRs for the quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and in fact, like, in my opinion, like all of MFS should come into like a big mutex and you should just do all of your pending operations and then batch them until they're done and then batch the next set. <laughs> like that would just make everything <laughs> inherently faster. Um, that's how like a lot of databases actually work when they have like big lock states. They're just like, okay, well, while I'm waiting for things to update, I just batch all the rest of the updates and then I can do the next batch of updates quicker once that returns. Um, like that, that is probably how MFS should work, like at some point in the future, using some of these new tools that we're building. I guess we're out of time, but just really quick for anyone who's on this call who isn't on our, um, we now have a shared Slack channel with the WASMR folks um, who are building WAPM. Um, and I think recap from the call, like I think it went super well. Um, they're like really excited. They're like, great, we're gonna like start integrating IPFS into our data, like our content store layer, like in, in a week now, like a week from now, which is awesome and super exciting. Um, and so definitely like work on our plate to make sure they have like a super great experience um, and also to learn from this. Cause you know, the end goal is not a single package manager who has this, it's, you know, understanding the pain points that um, folks run into and solving them, not just for package managers, but for all these other use cases. Um, and so I think a lot of, 
a lot of things that having a fast channel with them and, and quickly understanding like where they're heading, both from a design space, from like a technical space, um, from a like uh, an emotional space, like where they would tend to go um, and what, what sort of um, information is really valuable to them. All of that, I think we're gonna learn a ton, um, but they're just one group. So I think also folks keeping their eyes out for other groups um, that would be similarly excited and motivated to, to take this on because we'll learn different things um, and that will all be very useful for us. Ooh, this has been the package manager special interest group uh, meeting uh, for this week. I will see you all on the internet. Okay, bye.